Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Pastor Aaron Bauer, and we're just glad to be a part of your life in this way. We're going to sing a few songs. We're going to study the scripture together. We're going to pray. We're going to take communion. And I just pray that you'd be richly blessed. Uh, join us in person on Sunday mornings at 1030 a.m. We've got stuff for kids as well as for adults. I think you'll really enjoy just being together with people in community. Uh, we encourage you to, to look into that, Issaquah.cc. Uh, if you go to that website, you'll find ways to give, um, Issaquah.cc slash give. Uh, really appreciate your partnership and moving the gospel forward in our community. Uh, training disciple makers. Uh, we're really excited about the work God's doing there. Uh, join us on a Wednesday night uh, for an adult group study that has teens now uh, of, allowed as well. We're watching The Chosen, a film series that portrays the life of Jesus and his disciples. And we meet to view it, discuss it, and pray together. That's at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. We think you'd really enjoy that. So don't hesitate to reach out to us at office at issaquah.cc or go to our website and send in a prayer request. We want to be with you and for you to help you become like Jesus in this time, in these difficult times. We love you. And let me pray for you as we go into singing. God, would you pour out your blessing on the people? Would you cause by your spirit belief to rise up, that our trust in you would grow, that our allegiance to Jesus would be profound and noticeable as little pockets of renewal and new creation in a dark and decaying society. God, we love you. We're so thankful. Would you lead us into worship right now? Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone. Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the love of Christ I live. There is ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slay then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am His and He is mine. But with the precious blood of Christ, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Oh, 
21 years ago, Heather and I traveled to Guatemala to meet our first son for the first time. Uh, Jose Enrique had passed through the legal process and his name had officially been changed to Jose Enrique and then with our last names, Bauer Oudman. And just like that, Heather was ready to move to Guatemala City. He had lots of paperwork left to do to establish his immigration status, which is difficult for a six-month-old baby to do. Uh, but Heather was leaving soon, and she let me know I would be welcome to go with her. <laughs> and I look at this beautiful little blonde woman, and <laughs> she has no Spanish skills to speak of. And so I have decided it would be best to go along and, and go there and help hurry the lawyers along in the process of bringing my son home. <laughs> a lot of people have said to me, I don't think I could love a child that wasn't my own. And usually I say to them, well, I don't think I could love your child either. <laughs> Look at him. Uh, but this one was, this was different. When his name changed, he was my child. Right? <laughs> At the name change, he was my child. It was just a matter of now meeting him and certainly bringing him home. And, and Jose Enrique, later Kyler Aaron Bauer, had a fierce mama bear and fierce papa bear ready to do anything to get him home to the States. He was the boy that made us parents. He was the game changer. A whole new world opened up to us and everything has changed. As we see in the scriptures, with the death of Jesus and his resurrection, everything has changed for the people of Israel. Everything. And everything has begun to change for the rest of the world. The announcement of Jesus the Messiah and Lord and the forgiveness of sins means deliverance. This gospel means deliverance. Israel, you are no longer wandering in exile away from your God. This present age of separation and desperation has come to an end. Yahweh has come near and he's walked with you, taught you the way of the kingdom, died for you as the sacrificial lamb, has been raised from the dead. And when Jesus came out of that grave, new creation began. This is the beginning of the age to come, which was the hope for Israel. First, for Israel, and then also for the rest of the world. A new rescue, a new exodus for Israel, as well as an exodus and exile for the nations. Because when, when God did for Israel what Israel longed for him to do, then the Gentiles would come into the picture as well, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if Israel, the chosen people, felt the separation and desperation because of their unfaithfulness to Yahweh, 
Think about how the nations, who had only a distant memory of the Most High God, who was above all the gods of, of the nations that they were forced to serve, the separation and desperation of the nations, that sense of exile that they were in. Because remember, they were sent packing. They were divorced and sent packing in Genesis chapter 11. They were under the territorial authority of the divine beings who had become corrupted. So the nations were even more separated and despairing of any hope of being connected to the one true creator God. There was no forgiveness and no pathway until the cross, until Jesus drank the cup, the cup of wrath due to the nations for their idol worship and their wickedness. He actually stood in their place and he stands in our place. He's the new Adam, the new Adam who didn't give in to the whisper of the tempting serpent. The new Adam, the new progenitor of a new people formed in allegiance to the Son, to the glory of God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, out of that tomb on resurrection morning springs new creation. The age to come has begun. An all call to the nations has been announced. All authority, remember this in Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. So if Jesus has all the authority, then no longer do the territorial authorities who rule the nations, no longer do they have any authority. So all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all ethne, all the families, all the nations. And so the disciples went, and so we go in the power of the Spirit. Here in Acts 13, 44 through 52, Paul and Barnabas have delivered the announcement of freedom from exile by Jesus the Messiah in a beautiful sermon in a Jewish synagogue. It says here, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Jews, uh, when it's said like this, usually means the, the, those in leadership. They saw the crowds and they were filled with jealousy. Now, there are positive and negative connotations with that word jealousy. You might remember that Paul was zealous for the reputation of Yahweh. Well, that's a really good thing, right? These people had zealous energy for the old ways and jealous energy against Saul and Barnabas for drawing the crowd away. Right, so the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. And since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, right, the non-Jews, when the, the nations, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Oh, the word of the Lord. It's like a, it's got its own personage here glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. <laughs> now, before I finish the chapter, I want to deal with a few really big questions. Uh, what is eternal life? Can you reject it? How do you get it? And can you lose it? Very interesting and, and big questions, uh, but let's just take them in order. What is eternal life? Go ahead and turn to a neighbor. Uh, you can pause this. Uh, what is eternal life? Define, just define that. See, we speak of heaven, which is God's realm. Uh, God is spirit, and so we think of heaven as spiritual. No, right? You're tracking with me, right? But no bodies allowed. It's just the spiritual space. 
We've been taught that we'll leave these aching bodies behind. Oh, well, those will be buried in the grave or scattered over a stream and our souls will soar to a different realm. There's, there's something to that, but it's not the complete picture. What I've just described is what would be called life after life in the spiritual realm. But there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. There's life after life after life. That's the new creation. When, when God comes down and makes his dwelling with us here on earth. The brand new creation. But wait, if God's realm is non-material and spiritual because God is spirit and no bodies are allowed... And then, but Jesus has a body because he's raised from the dead and is at the right hand of God. He broke the rule that we made. <laughs> well, so, so maybe your question, what do I make of the resurrected Jesus who has a transformed, glorified body, but in a purely non-material, spiritual place? Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> Jesus at his resurrection marks the age to come. Eternal life translate and, and maybe confusingly the, the way our minds picture it, but the the phrase the life of the age. Hmm. This is in contrast to the Jewish concept of the present age that is passing away, looking forward to the start of God's new age. And what eternal life means is that the new age has begun. God's new age. Life of God's new age. It's the inbreaking of heaven on earth in a permanent, listen to me, a permanent, unstoppable movement toward the coming of new creation down from heaven. Even now we are pockets of renewal, of new creation activity as the church, but we wait for our Savior from God's realm to come and make all things new, the new Jerusalem out of heaven. Read Revelation 21 and chapter 22 for context there. So for the Jews of Paul's day, Tom Wright says, there were two ages or periods of world history, the present age and the age to come. And the life of the age to come is the state to which all devout Jews would aspire. Indeed, we know of debates among Jews of Paul's day and thereafter as to precisely who will inherit this life, the life of the age to come. But the point is, nobody, thinking within the framework of thought which this phrase reflects, imagined that this age would be eternal in our sense, where it's timeless, spaceless, matterless. That's what Tom Wright says, right? So he goes on to say it's a, it'll be a whole new period of history. This is in the, the Jewish thought of the day. When everything will be put right at last. Everything will be different, but it'll be still a world like ours, only much, much more so, more solid, more throbbing with life and energy. Because the curse of corruption and death itself will have been banished. Making it eternal in that sense, but not in our usual ones. Not in the usual sense of, of no matter, and it's just a spiritual realm, right? Right goes on to say, when Paul and the others spoke of eternal life, they didn't mean something, as we say, purely spiritual. The life of the coming age had already begun when Jesus came out of the tomb on Easter morning. And it'll be complete when God does for the whole world, all of creation, what he did for Jesus on that day. Get it? When, when, he, when Jesus came out of the tomb with a brand new body, it was the first fruits of the new creation. The down payment that said new creation is on its way. So when God does for the whole world what he did for Jesus that day. And all those who share in that Easter life in the present are assured of a full share of it in the future. So you partake now in the life of of God's new age, and then you get to be part of it forever as well. That's what it means to be part of the life of the coming age now and on that great day. So one, we answered that question. Eternal life is the life of God's new age breaking in, and we can be a part of that right now in Jesus Christ by the Spirit, and that extends for eternity. 
So question number two, can you reject it? What happens to the special chosen elect people of Israel, God's inheritance, if they reject the life of God's new age? Well, we just read that they they chose to reject it. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So if the Jewish people are the chosen, elect people of God, that means they're automatically brought into the life of God's new age, right? But but no, because they judged themselves unworthy of it and they rejected it. So often we hear the terms like elect and we say, oh, they're saved, right? Elect equals saved, right? Well, I want you to ponder something with me. Just go through this thought process with me. Was Israel elect? Oh, by the way, you could read dozens and dozens of passages that would say, yes, they're his chosen people, his elect people, his inheritance. But there were those of Israel who worshipped other gods through their unbelief in Yahweh, correct? They worshipped other gods, and so then they were cut off and exiled from the community, right? Yeah, are you nodding along? Yeah, they worshipped other gods, and so no, you cannot have any other Baal worshippers, any Molech worshippers. No, they are cut off from the community. You've worshipped them instead of Yahweh, and so you are apostate. You are outside of the community. You are no longer in the elect community. Okay, let me put it another way. Will there be Baal worshippers in heaven? No. No, only those who believe in Yahweh. And now, in this revelation, in Jesus, the Messiah. So, elect Israel has a subset, a, a remnant of those who believe and are saved. Do you, do you see that? Can you, can you think of the implications there uh, for us even today? So to be chosen, to be elect, it doesn't mean salvation because some of the elect are cut off from the community and salvation. And they're cut off through their unbelief. They're worshiping another god or no god at all. So election, argues Dr. Michael Heiser, meant simply that Israel alone had direct access to the true God and his true worship. He's living in their midst. They have access to the covenants, to the laws. They know how to live with God. That's a special role, special responsibilities. And they were to be a light unto the nations who were exiled, right? So this is their, their role here. So uh, we learn that eternal life is God's the life of God's new age breaking in, and we can be a part of that right now in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. And yes, you can reject Yahweh. You can reject the Son to your own peril, no matter if you are elect, if you have access to the covenant or not. So three, how do you get it? Well, election is privileged access, and <laughs> congratulations, you have it right now. You were listening. Right? The Gentiles in Antioch of Pisidia had privileged access through the missionaries in their town. They've obviously been chosen. What will they do with that? When the Gentiles heard this, what did it say? They were thrilled and they praised the word of the Lord. All those who were marked out for the life of God's new age became believers. So you confess Jesus as Lord. Do this. Jesus, you are Lord, and, and you receive the forgiveness of your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross, and then you persist in that belief, right? Are there any Jesus-denying unbelievers in heaven gathered around the throne? i got to ask you. Are there any Jesus-denying unbelievers in heaven gathered around the throne? Hmm. No, that's what you do. You get it, you get it, and you persist. So the fourth question, can you lose it? Can you lose your salvation? Can you, you lose eternal life? I have heard this question as much or more than any other. My usual response, can you lose your salvation? I, I say something like it. Do you mean like you lost your keys and you don't know where you put them? Like, oh, I must have set my salvation somewhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> is that is that what we mean? It's an interesting, tricky question that maybe even needs to be rephrased. Because here's the truth. The best of us have said and done some unfaithful things. Yes? <laughs> but Jesus is faithful. And we put our trust in him, not in our own ability to do the right thing all the time. Right? The best of us have pounded on heaven's door, trying to get God to respond. We've prayed, struggled, and slumped into a pile of discouragement. And yet, we've had the belief that even if God wasn't responding like he wanted, we still believe in him, and we believe that he can rescue us, right? It's unbelief that's the problem. Your sin doesn't separate you from Jesus. It, it actually draws Jesus near when you ask for forgiveness. I know that sounds controversial. Your sin doesn't keep Jesus away, right? It doesn't keep Jesus away. It actually draws him near. When you ask for forgiveness, he is ready to forgive you. If you reach out in faith to him, he reaches back with his faithfulness. Sin does separate us from God, but through Jesus we have forgiveness of sins. It's unbelief that's the problem. Worship of another God or no God. Rejecting Jesus the Messiah. That's what damns a person. So losing your salvation might be the wrong phrase. You know, rejecting the one who brings it, right? Rejecting the Savior might be a better question. Now listen to Mike Heiser's response to this question. He says, the bottom line is this. Regardless of what profession we make or have made in terms of faith in Christ, we must believe to have eternal life. We are not eternally secure because of a prayer we prayed at some point in our past if we don't believe now. There is no assurance without belief. There is no security without belief. No one goes to heaven who does not believe the gospel. We must believe. Well, what about the Old Testament saints and they didn't have Jesus? Well, <laughs> those who don't believe whatever revelation God gave to them to elicit the faith response before the work of Christ. But we must believe. Only believers. Unbelief is a decision of the heart that one no longer believes the gospel that one no longer wishes to follow Christ. We cannot believe and then not believe and then assume we have eternal life. That's a sharp word, but doesn't it make sense? John 3.36 says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So no one is in heaven who does not believe. Okay, can we, can we say that? In light of all this, um, Heiser goes on, someone will surely ask, do you believe someone can lose their salvation? Or are, there, are the believers eternally secure? Heiser says, I don't really like the way that question is framed, since for me it doesn't capture what the scripture teaches. By way of response, I'd rather ask the asker, which of these propositions would you deny? Okay, so maybe you're pushing against this and you're like, no, I heard and I learned and I believed and once saved and you're always saved and this is the deal and and uh, we just need to think in different terms here for a second. So which, if you're, and it's fine if you want to email me, talk back about this, that's great. If you want to, um, if you want to push back on this, which of these would you deny? These are Heiser's statements. Everyone who believes the gospel will be saved by grace and not by any merit of their own. Yeah. Everyone who believes the gospel will be eternally secure. Everyone who does not believe the gospel, like rejects it, will not be saved regardless of works. Everyone who does not believe the gospel will not be eternally secure, right? So we framed the question so differently to try to fit our categories, this life of the new age. But you have to believe to be a part of it, right? 
And if you cease to believe, you reject and you push off, then how would you say, oh yeah, I'm a part of it? Now, I don't mean sin, right? Sin happens, but it's unbelief that is the big deal, right? There were a lot of people who sinned in the Old Testament, a lot of people who sinned in the New Testament, but God says, no, it's about belief and unbelief. If you believe, you have eternal life. The chapter closes like this, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So we'll pick up the story in Iconium. But this is the deal. The announcement of Jesus the Messiah as Lord of all is disruptive. Right? It leaves some angry, some aggressive, some filled with joy and the Spirit, despite the opposition of the angry and aggressive people. So let me leave you with one tr practical training piece to help you confess Jesus as Lord and be filled with the Spirit and joy. Okay, would you let me do that? Okay, so here's the deal. We've seen in the book of Acts how the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believers who confess Jesus the Messiah as Lord of all, right? The Spirit comes and fills them. He indwells all the believers at all times. That's what it means to believe. You have the Spirit now indwelling with you. You're, you're part of the new temple space for God to indwell. We've been forgiven of sin, freed from the rule of the other gods, baptized, come through the waters of the new exodus for God to dwell in our midst. So it's curious then though we have the Spirit indwelling in us, that Paul will command the believers in Ephesus to be filled with the Spirit. Oh, wait, didn't that already happen? They were, they were indwelled, right? Yes, they were indwelled, but could any one of us say that we are completely controlled by the Holy Spirit? They weren't completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. The terrain had a lot more, <laughs> a lot more conquering in their own lives, right? Indwelling and filling are then separate things. There's a lot more territory that God wants to take over in your life and in our life together. Yeah, we pray that, right? May your kingdom come, may your will be done in our lives as it is in God's realm, on earth as it is in heaven. And I think this training piece will be a game changer for you. I know it has been for thousands of people. We are indwelt, but we're yet commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Each day, I encourage you to practice a prayer like this. Jesus, you are Lord of all. You have saved me, you've rescued me, you love me, and you want to fill me with your Spirit. Would you look into my heart for areas where I've rejected you, or allowed my selfish, independent nature to corrupt myself and others. I, I not only confess you as Lord, but I confess my sins as wrong and disgraceful. You've commanded me to be filled with the Spirit, and so I confess my sins. And I thank you for your forgiveness and cleansing, and ask you to again fill me with your Spirit. Control my life. You are the source of life and love and joy, and I receive that along with the Spirit. Lead me on, I will follow. If you pray a prayer like that, where you confess Jesus is Lord, confess your sin, receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit, your life will take on new trajectory. Jesus, lead on. We'll begin to live in the life of God's new age, anticipating the Savior who will come back to do for the world what God did for Jesus' body on that resurrection day. As we take communion, the first step is confessing Jesus as Lord, right? We, we hold his body in our hands. He says, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the Spirit can indwell 
a temple that is filthy. And so his, his blood has to cleanse us, stand in our place as a sacrifice for us. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. The new age is beginning. He said, do this in remembrance of me.
take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that God would richly bless you, encourage you, strengthen you, and hopefully we'll see you again on a Sunday morning. We'd love to have you there, 10.30 a.m. Just go ahead and come. Uh, we're keeping socially distanced, uh, masked up, and hopefully we can just connect with you in a, in a deeper way. We love this and this opportunity, but send me an email, Aaron at Issaquah.cc, or check out our website for details. We love you, and we're so thankful for you.